Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories Featuring Overpopulation To Be or Not to Be by Kurt Vonnegut, Jr. Guest Expert by Alan Kim Lang The Amateurs by Alan Cogan Preferred Position by Dave Dreyfus The Walls by Keith Lorma To Be or Not To Be by Kurt Vonnegut, Jr. Originally published in Worlds of If, January 1962 Narrated by Tom Trusser Got a problem? Just pick up the phone. It solved them all, and all the same way. Everything was perfectly swell. There were no prisons, no slums, no insane asylums, no cripples, no poverty, no wars. All diseases were conquered. So was old age. Death, barring accidents, was an adventure for volunteers. The population of the United States was stabilised at 40 million souls. One bright morning in the Chicago Lying-In Hospital, a man named Edward K. Welling Jr. waited for his wife to give birth. He was the only man waiting. Not many people were born a day anymore. Welling was 56 a mere stripling in a population whose average age was 129. X-rays had revealed that his wife was going to have triplets. The children would be his first. Young Wailing was hunched in his chair, his head in his hand. He was so rumpled, so still and colourless as to be virtually invisible. His camouflage was perfect, since the waiting room had a disorderly and demoralised air too. Chairs and ashtrays had been moved away from the walls. The floor was paved with spattered drop cloths. The room was being redecorated. It was being redecorated as a memorial to a man who had volunteered to die. A sardonic old man, about two hundred years old, sat on a stepladder, painting a mural he did not like. Back in the days when people aged visibly, his age would have been guessed at thirty-five or so. Aging had touched him that much before the cure for aging was found. The mural he was working on depicted a very neat garden. Men and women in white, doctors and nurses, turned the soil, planted seedlings, sprayed bugs, spread fertilizer. Men and women in purple uniforms pulled up weeds, cut down plants that were old and sickly, raked leaves, carried refuse to trash burners. Never, 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 not even in medieval Holland or old Japan, had a garden been more formal, been better tended. Every plant had all the loam, light, water, air and nourishment it could use. A hospital orderly came down the corridor, singing under his breath a popular song. If you don't like my kisses, honey, here's what I will do. I'll go see a girl in purple, kiss this sad world toodaloo. If you don't want my loving, why should I take up all this space? I'll get off this old planet, let some sweet baby have my place. The orderly looked in at the mural, and the muralist. Looks so real, he said, I can practically imagine I'm standing in the middle of it. "'What makes you think you're not in it?' said the painter. He gave a satiric smile. "'It's called the Happy Garden of Life, you know.' "'That's good of Dr. Hitz,' said the orderly. He was referring to one of the male figures in white, whose head was a portrait of Dr. Benjamin Hitz, the hospital's chief obstetrician. Hitz was a blindingly handsome man. "'Lot of faces still to fill in,' said the orderly. He meant that the faces of many of the figures in the mural were still blank. All blanks were to be filled with portraits of important people on either the hospital staff or from the Chicago office or the Federal Bureau of Termination. 
Must be nice to be able to make pictures that look like something, said the orderly. The painter's face curdled with scorn. You think I'm proud of this daub, he said. You think this is my idea of what life really looks like? What's your idea of what life looks like, said the orderly. The painter gestured at a foul drop croft. There's a good picture of it, he said. Frame that, and you'll have a picture a damn sight more honest than this one. You're a gloomy old duck, aren't you? said the orderly. Is that a crime? said the painter. The orderly shrugged. If you don't like it here, Grandpa, he said, and he finished the thought with a trick telephone number that people who didn't want to live any more were supposed to call. The zero in the telephone number he pronounced naught. The number was to be or not to be. It was the telephone number of an institution whose fanciful sobriquets included Automat, Birdland, Cannery, Catbox, De Lauser, Easy Go, Goodbye Mother, Happy Hooligan, Kiss Me Quick, Lucky Pierre, Sheep Dip, Warring Blender, Weep No More, and Why Worry. To be or not to be was the telephone number of the municipal gas chambers of the Federal Bureau of Termination. The painter thumbed his nose at the orderly. When I decide it's time to go, he said, it won't be at the sheep dip. A do it yourself, eh? said the orderly. Messy business, Grandpa. Why don't you have a little consideration for the people who have to clean up after you? The painter expressed with an obscenity his lack of concern for the tribulations of his survivors. The world could do with a good deal more mess, if you ask me, he said. The orderly laughed and moved on. Wailing, the waiting father mumbled something about raising his head, and then he fell silent again. A coarse, formidable woman strode into the waiting room on spike heels. Her shoes, stockings, trench coat, bag and overseas cap were all purple, the purple the painter called the colour of grapes on Judgment Day. The medallion on her purple musette bag was the seal of the service division of the Federal Bureau of Termination, an eagle perched on a turnstile. The woman had a lot of facial hair, an unmistakable moustache in fact. A curious thing about gas chamber hostesses was that, no matter how lovely and feminine they were when recruited, they all sprouted moustaches within five years or so. Is this where I'm supposed to come? she said to the painter. A lot would depend on what your business was, he said. You aren't about to have a baby, are you? They told me I was supposed to pose for some picture, she said. My name's Leora Duncan, she waited. And you dunk people, he said. What? she said. Skip it, he said. That sure is a beautiful picture, she said. It looks just like heaven or something. Or something, said the painter. He took a list of names from his smock pocket. Duncan, 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 he said, scanning the list. Yes, here you are. You're entitled to be immortalised. See any faceless body here you'd like me to stick your head on? We've got a few choice ones left. She studied the mural bleakly. Gee, she said, they're all the same to me. I don't know anything about art. A body's a body, eh? He said. All righty. As a master of fine art, I recommend this body here. He indicated a faceless figure of a woman who was carrying dried stalks to a trash burner. Well, said Leora Duncan, that's more the disposal people, isn't it? I mean, I'm in service. I don't do any disposing. The painter clapped his hands in mock delight. You say you don't know anything about art, and then you prove in the next breath that you know more about it than I do. Of course, the sheep carrier is wrong for a hostess. A snipper, a pruner, that's more your line. He pointed to a figure in purple who was sawing a dead branch from an apple tree. How about her? He said. You like her at all? Gosh, she said, and she blushed and became humble. That, that puts me right next to Dr. Hitz. That upsets you, he said. Good gravy, no, she said. It's it's just such an honour. Ah, you, you admire him, eh? He said. 
"'Who doesn't admire him?' she said, worshipping the portrait of Hitz. It was the portrait of a tanned, white-haired, omnipotent Zeus, 240 years old. "'Who doesn't admire him?' she said again. "'He was responsible for setting up the very first gas chamber in Chicago.' "'Nothing would please me more,' said the painter, "'than to put you next to him for all time. "'Sawing off a limb that strikes you as appropriate?' "'That is kind of like what I do,' she said. "'She was demure about what she did. "'What she did was make people comfortable while she killed them.' "'And, while Leora Duncan was posing for a portrait, "'into the waiting-room bounded Dr. Hitz himself.' He was seven feet tall, and he boomed with importance, accomplishments, and the joy of living. "'Well, Miss Duncan, Miss Duncan,' he said, and he made a joke. "'What are you doing here?' he said. "'This isn't where people leave. This is where they come in.' "'We're going to be in the same picture together,' she said shyly. "'Good,' said Dr. Hitz heartily. "'And say, isn't that some picture?' "'I sure am honoured to be in it with you,' she said. "'Let me tell you,' he said, "'I'm honoured to be in it with you. "'Without women like you, this wonderful word we've got wouldn't be possible.' He saluted her and moved towards the door that led to the delivery rooms. "'Guess what was just born?' he said. "'I can't,' she said. "'Triplets!' he said. "'Triplets!' she said. She was exclaiming over the legal implications of triplets." The law said that no newborn child could survive unless the parents of the child could find someone who would volunteer to die. Triplets, if they were all to live, called for three volunteers. "'Do the parents have three volunteers?' said Leora Duncan. "'Last I heard,' said Dr. Hitz, "'they had one, and were trying to scrape another two up.' "'I don't think they made it,' she said. "'Nobody made three appointments with us.' Nothing but singles going through today, unless somebody called in after I left. What's the name? Whaling, said the waiting father, sitting up, red-eyed and frowsy. Edward K. Whaling, Jr. is the name of the happy father-to-be. He raised his right hand, looked at a spot on the wall, gave a hoarsely wretched chuckle. Present, he said. Oh, Mr. Whaling, said Dr. Hitz, I didn't see you. "'The invisible man,' said Whaling. "'They just phoned me that your triplets have been born,' said Dr. Hitz. "'They're all fine, and so is the mother. "'I'm on my way in to see them now.' "'Hooray!' said Whaling emptily. "'You don't sound very happy,' said Dr. Hitz. "'What man in my shoes wouldn't be happy?' said Whaling. "'He gestured with his hands to symbolise carefree simplicity.' All I have to do is pick out which one of the triplets is going to live, then deliver my maternal grandfather to the happy hooligan, and come back here with a receipt. Dr. Hitz became rather severe with Whaling, towered over him. You don't believe in population control, Mr. Whaling, he said. I think it's perfectly keen, said Whaling tautly. Would you like to go back to the good old days when the population of the earth was twenty billion, about to become forty billion, then eighty billion, then one hundred and sixty billion? Do you know what a drupele is, Mr. Whaling? said Hitz. Nope, said Whaling sulkily. A drupelet, Mr. Whaling, is one of the little knobs, one of the little pulpy grains of a blackberry, said Dr. Hitz. Without population control, human beings would now be packed on this surface of this old planet like drupelets on a blackberry. Think of it. Whaling continued to stare at the same spot on the wall. "'In the year 2000,' said Dr. Hitz, "'before scientists stepped in and laid down the law, "'there wasn't even enough drinking water to go around "'and nothing to eat but seaweed. "'And still people insisted on their right to reproduce like jackrabbits, "'and their right, if possible, to live to forever.' "'I want those kids,' said Whaling quietly. "'I want all three of them.' "'Of course you do.' said Dr. Hitz. That's only human. I don't want my grandfather to die either, said Whaling. Nobody's really happy about taking a close relative to the cat box, said Dr. Hitz gently, sympathetically. I wish people wouldn't call it that, said Leora Duncan. What? said Dr. Hitz. I wish people wouldn't call it the cat box, and things like that, she said. It gives people the wrong impression. 
You're absolutely right, said Dr. Hitz. Forgive me. He corrected himself, gave the municipal gas chambers their official title, a title no one ever used in conversation. I should have said, Ethical Suicide Studios, he said. That sounds so much better, said Leora Duncan. This child of yours, whichever one you decide to keep, Mr. Whaling, said Dr. Hitz, he or she is going to live on a happy, roomy, clean, rich planet, thanks to population control. In a garden like that mural there, he shook his head, two centuries ago, when I was a young man, it was a hell that nobody thought could last another twenty years. Now centuries of peace and plenty stretch before us as far as the imagination cares to travel. He smiled luminously. The smile faded as he saw that Whaling had just drawn a revolver. Whaling shot Dr. Hitz dead. There's room for one, a great big one, he said. And then he shot Leora Duncan. It's only death, he said to her as she fell. There, room for two. And then he shot himself, making room for all three of his children. Nobody came running. Nobody, seemingly, heard the shots. The painter sat on the top of his stepladder, looking down reflectively on the sorry scene. The painter pondered the mournful puzzle of life, demanding to be born, and once born, demanding to be fruitful, to multiply and to live as long as possible, to do all that on a very small planet that would have to last forever. All the answers that the painter could think of were grim, even grimmer, surely, than a catbox, a happy hooligan, an easy go. He thought of war, he thought of plague, he thought of starvation. He knew that he would never paint again. He let his paintbrush fall to the drop cloths below, and then he decided he had had about enough of life in the happy garden of life too, and he came slowly down from the ladder. He took Whaling's pistol, really intending to shoot himself, but he didn't have the nerve. And then he saw the telephone booth in the corner of the room. He went to it, dialed the well-remembered number, 2B, are not to be. Federal Bureau of Termination, said the very warm voice of a hostess. How soon could I get an appointment? He asked, speaking very carefully. We could probably fit you in late this afternoon, sir, she said. It might even be earlier if we get a cancellation. All right, said the painter. Fit me in, if you please. And he gave her his name, spelling it out. Thank you, sir, said the hostess. Your city thanks you, your country thanks you, your planet thanks you, but the deepest thanks of all is from future generations. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Guest Expert by Alan Kim Lang Originally published in Planet Stories, January 1951. Narrated by Tom Tudor. Earth had a problem, and the Martian visitor had a very deadly means of solving it. I'm only here to help you, said the man from Mars. You've proved that, the secretary admitted. In the six weeks that you've been here, you've wiped out rabies, measles, and the common cold. But, sir, this latest proposal of yours is blasphemous. The man from Mars waved an appendage in the direction of the secretary's desk, atop which a newspaper was lying open. After reading what that paper has to say, can you still doubt that what I propose is necessary? The young man in uniform crossed the room and picked up the newspaper. He read the headlines aloud, bitterly. Indian Famine Army Storms New Delhi. Tasman Republic Bids for Place in Sun. Plague Decimates Lower Nile. You could end that plague, the assistant's voice was accusing. I could, of course. The battles and the starvation would still be with you, though. Why do you persist in treating the symptoms instead of the sickness? I am an objective observer, far enough away from your problems to see them clearly, something which no human can ever hope to do. 
You earthlings suffer war and famine and plague for one reason only, that there are four and eight tenth billions of you living on an earth which can feed only about two and a half billion of you well. Gentlemen, the population of your planet must be reduced by one half as your race is to survive. Couldn't we send our surplus population to Mars or to Venus? The assistant asked. The man from Mars winced. The sands of Mars can't support cactuses, much less fields of wheat and rice and corn. Venus is a solid sea or formaldehyde solution. He glanced around to each of the three men in the room. To you, my scheme may seem heartless. But would it be more cruel to kill millions now than to allow billions to die in continual war in the next thousand years? Do you remember your last such war? The Ukrainian wheatlands scorched to desert by the thermonucleus. New England swept by epidemics of anthrax and tularemia. All China tortured by starvation and the hundred nagging sicknesses that follow hunger. Yes, I remember. The secretary rolled his pen between his fingers, staring at it. How do you intend to liquidate the excess two billions? I can't explain it to you. You lack the basic knowledge. It will be quick and painless, though, I promise. Then Earth will see peace and hope, a new start. I couldn't take all the responsibility for this decision upon myself, the secretary said. He glanced hopefully toward the assistant and the young man in uniform. Their eyes flinched away. You might take a vote, suggested the man from Mars. He picked up the secretary's scratch pad and ripped off three sheets of paper. Just mark yes or no. I will respect your decision. After all, I am only here to help you. The secretary stared at the slip of paper lying on his desk. He glanced toward the other two humans for encouragement, but the assistant was staring at the wall across the room, and the young man in uniform was silently contemplating the carpet at his feet. Convulsively, the secretary scooched the paper toward him and scribbled his vote. Folding the paper, he looked demandingly toward his two companions. The young man in uniform looked up, then turned to hold his paper against the wall as he wrote his decision. The assistant remained seated, holding the paper on top of a book while he lettered out his vote. The man from Mars collected the three ballots, unfolded them, and read the three votes. It's two to one, he announced. He crushed the papers into small white pellets and tossed them out the open window. What I have to do will be finished by noon tomorrow. The man from Mars left the room, closing the door very softly behind him. The other three sat silent a moment, then got up and left without looking one another in the face. The next day, the secretary and the assistant sat in the office, staring at the clock above the door. At 12.07, the door slammed open for the young man in uniform. Is it done? the assistant asked. Done? Of course it's done. The young man in uniform leaned against the door and shook with spasmic laughter. Now there's food enough and room enough for everyone. The man from Mars promised to solve our population problem. He did. At twelve noon, Eastern Daylight Saving Time, every woman and girl on Earth dropped dead. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. The Amateurs by Alan Cogan Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction, July 1955. Narrated by Tom Trussell. The ultimate show demanded the ultimate in showmanship. Now if only Mr. Sims could measure up. To Mr. Sims it seemed as though they had walked along a hundred corridors, and as he followed Mr. Hood he felt as though he was taking the last walk to the gallows or the electric chair. 
When the director finally led him outside, Mr. Sims realised with a slight twinge of fear that he hadn't really expected to see daylight again. They were in the rich rolling parkland at the rear of the palace and walking across the immaculate turf where coloured fountains frolicked and shimmered in the sun. Lilting music floated out from a dozen hidden sources. The two men sat down on a seat facing the palace with its towering columns and fast marble steps. It's a very nice place, Mr. Sims commented, remembering that he hadn't said a word for at least five minutes. I suppose it's all right, Arthur Hood agreed, his thin nostrils twitching condescendingly. He was a small, sleek man with a habit of emphasising his words with airy gestures of his slim hands. That section of the palace is the part I consider most uninteresting. After all, there's nothing but row upon row of stuffy little rooms where people come to die, and they take a long time doing it, too. Mr. Sims winced noticeably. You'll forgive me if I don't appear overly sanctimonious about death, Mr. Hood said, smiling. It's just that the other directors and myself decided we must take a realistic view of the situation. A place like this could become pretty morbid, you know, and there's actually no reason why a guest's last hours here shouldn't be pleasant and satisfying. Pleasant and satisfying. The key words when you spoke of Sunnyland's palace, Mr. Sims thought grimly. Everyone used them when not going there. The words gave him a hollow, frightened feeling inside, perhaps because they made him remember the first time he had heard them used. It's a pleasant place and quite satisfying, Dr. Van Stoke had said. There's no need to think of it as some kind of torture camp. But why should I go there at all? Mr. Sims had asked. I don't want to die. I'm only fifty-six and I've got nine more years left. Try and understand I'm doing you a good turn, the doctor had said. You've lived fifty-six good years in your, in your condition. The last nine won't be so good. You'll have pains attacks. You won't be able to do anything strenuous. You'll hate to live under those conditions. I could always give it a try, Mr. Sims had protested. Dr. Van Stoke had frowned bleakly over the tops of his glasses. I know I'm a friend and family doctor, the frown had said, but I'm also district referee under euthanasian legislation, and you are becoming a burden to society, so don't make my job any more difficult. He had signed his name at the bottom of the form, and Mr. Sims had had a hollow, anxious feeling ever since. "'There's one thing I haven't found out yet,' he said to Mr. Hood. "'Is it in order for me to ask how and when I can expect to die?' "'Certainly,' Mr. Hood said. "'It's the reason I brought you here to talk. "'You see, anyone sent here under the legislation is given a completely free choice as to the manner of his departure.' Most people, although they realise this, show a distressing lack of imagination when the time comes. They seem unable to think beyond the ordinary methods of taking a pill, or a needle, or a poisoned cocktail. I can't say I'd thought about it either, Mr. Sims admitted. We have a service to assist you, said the director. We of the Sunnyland staff have discovered what you might call a philosophy of dying. For instance, if a man lives an active life, there's no reason why he should be subjected to a sneaking prick of a needle in his sleep just because he reaches the age of sixty-five. We discovered that a few people objected strongly to such methods. There are some people who would prefer to die fighting. We had a couple who chose the firing squad, for instance. Another desired the guillotine, and nothing would satisfy him but a ride to his fate in a real tumbrel. Because of these up ah, pioneers, our advisory bureau has been set up. You mean you obliged them, with a guillotine and everything? Mr. Sims asked. Certainly, though most choose the sneaking, cowardly way out. As far as I'm concerned, they died as they lived, ignominiously. It's depressing. We have the best accommodation, food, entertainment, everything the guest requires during his three days here. Then they go ahead and die their miserable deaths. Somehow it makes all the luxury seem like pink sugar frosting around a rotten cake. And that's why we're always happy to find a guest with a proper spirit, 
Mr. Hood said. Mr. Sims listened in silence to the sales talk, wondering absent-mindedly what the director's personal interest was in other people's death. "'I took the liberty of looking up your record,' Mr. Hood continued. "'I picked you out for a personal talk, because I see you led an interesting life.' He paused in recollection with a theatrically thoughtful finger pressed to his chin, his eyes gazing skyward. "'You made a small fortune in oil in Central America before you were twenty. That was followed by more success in Hemelium mining in northern Canada. An excellent Third World War record, too. Founder of transcontinental rocket lines, co-builder of the Venus rocket. Oh, and a dozen other things. Quite a career. Mr. Sims brightened a little. He smiled modestly. Too bad you had to come here at fifty-six, Mr. Hood remarked. Heaven knows what you might have done with those last nine years. Heart trouble, wasn't it? "'So I've been told,' Mr. Sims said, slipping black into his former glum mood. He still did not believe he was a sick man, but perhaps this was because things had moved too fast and he had not been given enough time to get used to the idea. "'It's a serious cardiac condition,' Dr. Van Stoker told him at the annual examination. "'Due to an overactive life, I'll have to recommend you for Sunnylands.' And that had been the first mention of the subject." but I never had heart trouble in my life. The graphs show the condition clearly. There's nothing anyone can do to remedy it. I'll have to submit your name. He had protested, threatened, pleaded. Overpopulation, elimination of needless suffering, burden to society, duty to humanity. The clichés had tripped glibly off the doctor's tongue as he signed the form. Will you please send in a member of the family? I'll give him the final instructions, save you the trouble of worrying over little details during the final weeks. Since then, things had moved more swiftly behind the scenes, and he had had to do nothing except prepare himself, or adopt a realistic attitude, as Mr. Hood would have described it. But he had lived too much to allow him to get used to the idea of dying in two short weeks. He hadn't even started to get realistic about it which was probably why he could sit talking so calmly about death at that moment. "'We could give your life a climax,' the director was saying. "'A man like you shouldn't just fade away in one of those little cubicles.' He waved a hand in the direction of the shaded windows at the rear of the palace. "'You should die magnificently.' "'Magnificently?' Mr. Sims repeated. "'What do you have in mind?' It's what you have in mind that counts. I can offer you a lot of advice, but the final choice is yours. For instance, a large number of men like to die in some sort of combat, with guns or swords, or even with animals. We had one man who fought a tiger. Another fulfilled a lifelong ambition to play the role of bullfighter. Perhaps I should explain. The government allows each guest a generous sum of money to pay for his departure. As most people do not use one hundredth of this sum, we have a rather large fund at the disposal of those who want to use it. The bullfighter was a good example, he went on. We had a large ring built for him. He was given horses, uniforms, picadores, and a bull specially imported from Spain. It was a wonderful afternoon." He paused in contemplation of the memory, while Mr. Sim looked on, tactfully refraining from asking the outcome. "'Another time we had a group of old soldiers who wanted to die in battle,' Mr. Hood added. "'We built them an old-fashioned concrete blockhouse, then gave them authentic uniforms, machine-guns, grenades and rifles, and had one group attacking and the other defending.' "'Did they actually volunteer for that?' Mr. Sims asked. "'Of course, and I'll swear they enjoyed every minute of it, right down to the last man. "'As a matter of fact, we're planning the same thing on a larger scale "'with a reenactment of Custer's last stand to be held in 2013. "'One of the men in research is working full-time on that project. "'So far, we have a tentative list of 138 names. "'It'll be held in the park over there.' "'He waved gaily in the direction of the quiet meadow "'which would one day become another little big horn.' Mr. Sims moved along the seat slightly, as though his companion had started to smell. It was as if, for the first time, he had noticed the glazed, visionary look in Mr. Hood's eye. The director, he realised, 
would be capable of re-enacting Hiroshima if given the required number of volunteers. "'I'll have to leave you, I'm afraid,' said Mr. Hood, standing up. "'But if you'd like to think the matter over some more, I can offer you a fine selection of books to read about famous deaths, duels, acts of heroism, and such throughout history.' It's an interesting notion, Mr. Sims said. I'll think about it. Mr. Sims tried to avoid the director all that day and all the following morning. He tried hard to convince himself that this was because he disliked the other's bloodthirsty tendencies, although he knew the truth was that his choice of departure was a cowardly one. Nevertheless, he argued with himself. It was his choice, his death, and his mind was made up. Besides, he felt lonely, and this might be an opportunity to see the family again, even though they probably wouldn't like it. It was the director who finally located Mr. Sims. "'Are you enjoying your stay here?' he asked heartily. Mr. Sims winced as though the cold hand of death itself had slapped him on the back. "'Have you come to any decision yet?' Mr. Sims nodded. "'Yes.' I looked at the book last night and decided on Socrates. Just a simple cup of hemlock. A slight frown shadowed the director's features. Was it contempt? Mr. Sims wondered. Or disappointment, because he had failed in his attempts to make poisoning seem a socially inferior way of dying. Nothing glamorous about such a departure, he realised. No disdainful refusal of the blindfold when gazing bravely into the levelled muzzles of the firing squad. No bullfight, armed combat, duel, or ferocious carnivores. The director shrugged. Well, it's tranquil and dignified, I suppose. He conceded finally. Then the practical streak in his nature came to the forefront, and his mind ran quickly over the possibilities. If I remember correctly, Socrates died in the company of a number of good friends. They discussed philosophy. I'll have my family instead. I've no idea what we'll talk about. The names are on this list. It's irregular. Nevertheless, I want them here. All right, said Mr. Hood, disappointed. I'll send for them today. I'll also see the lab about some hemlock and something authentic to hold it in. An amphora, or whatever the Greeks used. By the way, I'm not too well acquainted with Socrates. Are there any unusual details? If there are, forget them, Mr. Sims said. The family and the hemlock will be sufficient. Mr. Hood sniffed peevishly. As you wish, be ready tomorrow. The rough woven garment was a concession to Mr. Hood, who said it was Grecon, and Mr. Sims wore it to make up for any annoyance he may have caused the director. It was rather itchy and much too warm, he thought, as he waited by the fountain at the far end of the park. The hemlock was in a bronze goblet on the parapet beside him. The family would be here soon. He wondered how they would feel about being dragged way out here. They arrived a half hour later. Cousin Nate, his two nephews, George and Alec, their wives, and George's five-year-old, Mike, Mr. Hood was also with them, but he left the party as soon as he had shown them where Mr. Sims was waiting. The meeting was restrained. Clearly they were not happy about making the trip. There were no smiles of greeting. Only young Mike showed any distinct interest. He sat down at Mr. Sims's feet, playing havoc with a lawn with a toy dagger. "'Where's the poison, Grandpa?' he asked eagerly. Mr. Sims lifted the boy up to his knee and rumpled his hair playfully in a feeble attempt to ease the tension. The others stood around, silently watching. No one made any move to sit down. It was their way of telling him they hoped they wouldn't have to wait too long. Mr. Sims suddenly wished he were in one of the quiet rooms of the palace, alone. Cousin Nate was the first one to break the awkward silence. "'Who in hell was that madman who brought us over here?' "'That's Mr. Hood, the director,' Mr. Sims explained. "'He's quite an artist in his way.' "'He's insane,' Nate said flatly. "'All the way over he talked about nothing but dying, 
told us we could come here and die any way we wanted. If any of us wanted to go out like early Christians, he would be only too happy to set up an arena for us. He even asked me if I wanted to put my name down for a rehash of Custer's last stand for 2013, with real bullets. He passed his hand nervously through his thinning hair. For God's sake, he must think I want to get scalped. Didn't Dr. Van Stoke come with you? Mr. Sims asked. I wanted him to see the place he sends everyone. He went on an ocean cruise, young Mike said. Dr. Van Stoke? You mean he left his practice? Yeah, the little boy answered. Another doctor took his place. Mr. Sims turned to the others for corroboration. Is that right? I didn't think Van Stoke was a rich man. He was only around forty. He went with the money Uncle Nate gave him, the boy said. That'll be enough, Michael, Nate ordered sternly. Mr. Sims laughed. You're mistaken, Mike. Uncle Nate wouldn't give the doctor any money. He hasn't even got enough for himself. But he quit his job yesterday, said the boy. Nate's voice cut in sharply. That's enough from you. You know what they say about little boys. Mr. Sims looked steadily at Nate as though seeing him for the first time. His cousin gazed back, half sullen, half defiant. It certainly didn't take you long to get your hands on the money, Mr. Sims said. It looks as if I can't die soon enough. But I still don't see where Dr. Van Stoke comes into. Then suddenly there was no need to ask. The answer was clear on Nate's tight, sullen face. Mr. Sims turned to the others for help and froze as identical expressions stared back coldly from each of them, piercing him with a long-hidden envy of his success, the pent-up hatred for the dependence on him. A choking, frightened sound came from deep in Mr. Sims' throat. For God's sake, how much did you pay him to put me away? He jumped quickly off the parapet, knocking the little boy to the ground, and hurled the hemlock into the fountain. He pushed his way past them and started to run. Then the woven garment twisted about his legs. He tried to lift it clear, but his foot caught in the hem and he stumbled. Nate was the first to move. He picked up the little toy dagger and fell on the struggling man. Without hesitating, he plunged the knife between Mr. Sims' shoulder blades and held it till the older man was still. Then he stabbed again, without malice, without any emotion, again and again. The blade made an odd ripping sound each time it pierced the woven robe. All of them looked away. One of the women leaned over the parapet, sick. When he was finally done, Nate stood up and cleaned the knife on the grass and then motioned them all back towards the palace. Mr. Hood met them as they walked through the foyer. "'Ah, Socrates' friends,' he said to Nate, who was dabbing at the front of his coat with a piece of tissue. "'Was everything in order?' "'There was a slight change of plan,' Nate said. "'He decided at the last moment to make a Julius Caesar.' He held the knife up in explanation. "'Julius Caesar? But—' but they were gone, filing out through the front door, the women sobbing in their handkerchiefs. No one looked back. The door hissed quietly shut. Mr. Hood started at the sound and then walked slowly into his office, seized by a cold, limp rage. From his window he could see them going down the driveway. Amateurs! he spat after them with deep disgust. Damned, lousy, unimaginative amateurs! The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Preferred Position by Dave Dreyfus Originally published by Imagination Stories of Science and Fantasy, April 1953 Narrated by Tom Trisser The bed woke them. Time to get up, dears, it could. Time to get up and greet the sun. Time to get up. 
Then the supporting magnetism faded and let the mattress drift gently to the soft, warm floor. Janet turned and opened her eyes, pouting at Les. He scowled back, grumbled something, and rolled away. She shook his film-coated shoulder. Come on, Les, come on, you'll feel better after coffee. Don't want any, he snarled. But the damage had been done. At the word coffee, a grotesque marionette opened the bedroom door and minced in with two steaming cups on a tray, swinging them artfully so that it appeared likely to spill, but didn't. For some years now, that dance had left Janet unamused. She was about to say so when Les growled. These darned dolls are a nuisance. I wish you'd order a plain automatic dispenser. They're even more boring, Janet argued, sitting up. Her gauzy film dress and sleepy face made her look appealingly childlike. She was fifty-five. Les was sixty, with a full head of blonde hair atop six and a half feet of slim, solid flesh. He sat up with the expression of an exasperated six-year-old. Go away, he told the doll. It did. But I wanted some, Janet wailed. She was careful, though, not to use the word that would cause the doll to return. Neither did Les. He said, Why don't we take a couple of pills and go back to sleep till tomorrow? There isn't a darn thing to do. There never is, Janet said, denoting she'd inadvertently agreed with her husband. She quickly added, But we can't sleep. We did that yesterday. If we don't move around, we'll practically stop eating, and anyway the neighbours will miss us. First thing you know, we'll be accused of either a hunger strike or immobility. Then they'll enslave us for attempting suicide. She sniffed in self-pity at the thought. Ah, honkum, Les said. Slavery'd be at least be a change, and slaves have something to do. Don't talk nonsense, Janet said tartly. You know perfectly well they always torture slaves. Yeah, but I just can't face this any longer. I've got sixty-five more years of longevity, according to the doctors, and they're never wrong, curse them. Sixty-five more years without the possibility of illness, want, risk. Even an accident is unlikely. Nothing's going to happen in all that time. Jan, I just can't face it. Isn't that just like a man? She scoffed. You know very well I've got seventy years to go. Five still to wait before I can even have my first child. You're just being selfish. They glowered at each other. Then Les rubbed her cheek with the back of his hand and smiled. Thanks, kid, he said. You really had me going for a minute. Now I feel better. Pleased with the compliment, Janet concocted an extra fancy combination of films to spray on herself for the morning's wear. When it was in place, she ordered a large breakfast and arranged to have the waiter doll do a special dance routine while serving. But Les's smile had vanished with the whiskers he'd rubbed off. He'd picked at his food, turned his back on the dancing, and afterward yawned away the few minutes they spent on their apartment's terrace, stared at by fifty thousand neighbours who lacked anything better to do. When Les wandered idly off, Janet followed. Les went to the living room, projected a book onto the ceiling, switched it off without reading, played with the glowing phosphors that lighted the room in colours he varied jarringly, fiddled with a console for the perfume aerosol, and created a stink, and then, in sheer despair, turned on the puppet set. Its lighted screen listed the necessary dolls and props, so he laid them out. Soon the three-foot stage reflected a broadcast picture of the state executive office. A stringless, formally dressed puppet sat at a desk, its blank face a transmitted facsimile of the governor's. The last time I can make this announcement, the governor was saying into a hidden microphone, the tests are to begin at noon. Jobs are now open. I repeat, jobs are now open. Men only, of course. But if any of you fellows out there suffer from boredom, and who doesn't in this wonderful state of ours that by virtue of the new energy sources guarantees leisured security to each citizen, if, I repeat, you suffer from ennui, then why not apply for a job? Do it now. No further vacancies will occur for years, and we have some really desirable positions open this morning. Appointment will be made strictly on merit, as usual, with a job for every applicant and the best job for the top man. 
Though it's true that losers in this competition are required to assume for life the less desirable duties that our civilization imposes, I assure you that it isn't as bad as it sounds. I was pretty dow found the list in my day, yet I only have to be governor. So won't you please apply? I want a lot of competition. The stage darkened, and the puppet got up and walked to its box. Before the lights could go up on the next programme, Les switched the set off. "'What do you think?' he asked Janet. "'I don't know,' she said. "'Nobody in my family has ever worked.' "'Mine either. "'But I once knew a fellow who tried for a job. "'He seemed okay to me, but he sure didn't get a good one. "'He had a clerical position with business machines, "'and their output was geared down to spread the work, "'so he didn't have enough to do. "'Just stacked punched cards or something every day for eighty years. "'Oh, you do better than that, dear.' Maybe. Point is, there are jobs worse than no job at all. I'm not so sure, Janet said, suddenly determined. Only a few minutes ago you weren't very happy about the idle days ahead. Why not take a chance? Take a chance? What kind of language is that? Chance went out along with disease and poverty and crime and accidents. You're way off base, Jan. But you have a chance. Oh, well, right, an opportunity, then if you like that better, to get a good job. Now, if I were a man, but you're not, still, maybe I'll try it. For the first time in a month or two, Janet kissed him warmly, and after she'd helped him into his wings and seen him off from the terrace, she felt a strange warm glow of anticipation. Not since she'd married had there been need for a decision that could bring change into her life. This was a day. It was a day for a lot of others, too. She learned that from the noon broadcast of the test ceremony. In my time, the governor said, speaking from the capital's rotunda, in my time a hundred aspirants was considered a good turnout. Today's applicants total a thousand. We haven't actually got a thousand jobs line up, but we'll get them. And I'm privileged to announce, now that the list of competitors has closed, that we do have the astoundingly large number of ten, repeat, ten, genuinely desirable appointments to make. Ten good jobs for a thousand applicants didn't sound to Janet like an astoundingly large number. She had been sprawled out on a magnetically positioned pad halfway between floor and ceiling, but she sat up when the governor stopped talking, and with a twinge of genuine and unwanted anxiety watched the long file of applicants as they approached in turn the brainwave analyzer the voice-operated sorter that would add their live files to current test results, and the officials who judged each man's configuration. She wished they'd announce the test results publicly, but knew they wouldn't. So when Les had gone through, about twenty minutes after the start, Janet shut off the broadcast, dissolved her dress films, and had herself rubbed by the massage machine. The morning suspense was proving too much for her, and she didn't want to have a headache when Les came home. But even the mechanical masseuse couldn't rub away her strange feelings. Not since marriage had Janet felt curiosity as to the future. What if he got so dull they never even argued about anything? She shivered at the thought. But then she smiled, and for the next hour Janet lay under the soothing massage and gave herself up to the delightful new pleasure of worrying. When Les returned, shadowing the terrace in his descent like some portentous bird, Janet began to shake. Without even waiting to kiss him, she said, How was it? How did you do? Les grinned teasingly. Help me malt first, she said. I'm tired. Unable to get anything else out of him until it was done, she tore his wings off damagingly, kissed him, and said, Now won't you say something? I'm hungry. No, she danced her impatience like a little girl. Tell me! But even as she pouted, her eyes sparkled in anticipation. I start tomorrow, he said. Did you get the best job? Nope, nope, I really didn't. What then? Second best. Oh, wonderful! What is it? Rigger and high climber. Topping trees, setting structural iron, fixing flagpoles that sort of things. Powderman was first. Oh, Rigger's wonderful! V 
visions of his future work flashed across her mind, implanted there by childhood hours spent watching other members of this elite profession at their thrilling work. She knew there could be broken cables, fallen pulleys, snapped booms, dropped loads. Every day would have its interesting possibilities. My darling! She threw her arms around him and was momentarily silenced by his kiss. Then she stepped back, looked admiringly up at him and said, Oh, I'm so happy for you, and so proud. I'm going right in and order up a nice big meal. I know you'll enjoy this one. It really might be your last. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. The Walls by Keith Lorma Originally published in Amazing Stories, March 1963 Narrated by Tom Tillerson Harry Trimble looked pleased when he stepped into the apartment. The lift door had hardly clacked shut behind him on the peering commuter faces in the car before he had slipped his arm behind Flora's back, bumped his face against her cheek and chuckled. Well, what would you say to a little surprise? Something you've waited a long time for. Flora looked up from the dialer ration panel. A surprise, Harry? I know how you feel about the apartment, Flora. Well, from now on, you won't be seeing so much of it. Harry! He winced at her clutch on his arm. Her face was pale under the day glare strip. We're not moving to the country? Harry pried his arm free. The country? What the devil are you talking about? He was frowning now, the pleased look gone. You should use the lamps more, he said. You look sick. He glanced around the apartment. The four perfectly flat rectangular walls, the glassy surface of the very glow ceiling, the floor with its pattern of sink-away panels. His eye fell on the four-foot square of the TV screen. I'm having that thing taken out tomorrow, he said. The pleased look was coming back. He cocked an eye at Flora. And I'm having a full wall installed. Flora glanced at the blank screen. A full wall, Harry? Yep. Harry smacked a fist into her palm, taking a turn up and down the room. We'll be the first in our cell block to have a full wall. Why, that will be nice, Harry. Nice? Harry punched the screen control, then deployed the two chairs with tray racks ready to receive the evening meal. Behind him, figures jiggled on the screen. It's a darn sight more than nice, he said, raising his voice over the shrill and thump of the music. It's expensive, for one thing. Who else do you know that can afford? But— But nothing. Imagine it, Flora. It'll be like having a— a balcony seat, looking out on other people's lives. But we have so little space now. Won't it take up? Of course not. How do you manage to stay so ignorant of technical progress? It's only an eighth of an inch thick. Think of it. That thick. Harry indicated an eighth of an inch with his fingers. And better colour and detail than you've ever seen. It's all done with what they call an edge excitation effect. Harry... The old screen is good enough. Couldn't we use the money for a trip? How do you know if it's good enough? You never have it on. I have to turn it on myself when I get home. Flora brought the trays, and they ate silently, watching the screen. After dinner, Flora disposed of the trays, retracted the table and chairs, and extended the beds. They lay in the dark, not talking. It's a whole new system, Harry said suddenly. The full wall people have their own programming scheme. They plan your whole day, wake you up at the right time with some lively music, give you breakfast menus to dial, then follow up with a good sitcom to get you into the day. Then there's nap music, with subliminal hypnotics if you have trouble sleeping. Then, Harry, can I turn it off if I want to? Turn it off? Harry sounded puzzled. The idea is to leave it on. That's why I'm having it installed for you, you know, so you can use it. But sometimes I'd like to just think. 
think brood you mean he heaved a sigh look flora i know this place isn't fancy sure you get a little tired of being here all the time but there are plenty of people worse off and now with full wall you'll get a feeling of more space harry flora spoke rapidly i wish we could go away i mean leave the city and get a little place where we can be alone even if it means working hard and where i can have a garden and maybe keep chickens and you could chop firewood good god harry roared cutting her off then these fantasies of yours he said quietly you have to learn to live in the real world flora live in the woods wet leaves wet bark bugs mould talk about depressing there was a long silence i know you're right harry flora said i'll enjoy the full wall it was very sweet of you to think of getting it for me sure harry said it'll be better you'll see the full wall was different flora agreed as soon as the serviceman had made the last adjustments and flipped it on there was vivid color fine detail and a remarkable sense of depth the shows were about the same fast-paced bursting with variety and energy it was exciting at first having full-sized people talking eating fighting taking baths making love right in the room with you if you sat across the room and half closed your eyes you could almost imagine you were watching real people of course real people wouldn't carry on like that but then it was hard to say what real people might do flora had always thought doll star wore padded brasseries but when she stripped on full wall there wasn't any fakery about it harry was pleased too when he arrived home to find the wall on he and flora would dial dinner with one eye on the screen then slip into bed and view until the bulldoze pills they'd started taking took effect perhaps things were better flora thought hopefully more like they used to be but after a month or two the full wall began to pall the same faces the same pratfalls the same happy quiz masters the puzzled prize winners the delinquent youths and fumbling dads the bosoms all the same on the 63rd day flora switched the full wall off the light and sound died leaving a faint dwindling glow she eyed the glassy wall uneasily as one might view the coffin of an acquaintance it was quiet in the apartment flora fussed with a dialer ration averting her eyes from the dead screen she turned to deploy the solitaire table and started violently the screen the residual glow having faded now was a perfect mirror she went close to it touched the hard surface with a finger it was almost invisible she studied her reflected face the large dark eyes with shadows under them the cheek line a trifle too hollow now to be really chic the hair drawn back in an uninspired bun behind her the doubled room unadorned now that all the furnishings were retracted into the floor except for the pictures on the wall photographs of the children away at school a sunny scene of green pasture land a painting of rolling waves at sea she stepped back considering the effect the floor and walls seemed to continue without interruption except for a hardly noticeable line it was as though the apartment were twice as large if only it weren't so empty flora deployed the table and chairs dialed a lunch and sat eating watching her double no wonder harry seemed indifferent lately she thought noting the rounded shoulders the insignificant bust the slack posture she would have to do something in the way of self-improvement half an hour of the silent companionship of her image was enough flora snapped the screen back on 
watched almost with relief as a grinning cowboy in velvet chaps made strumming motions while an intricately fingered guitar melody blared from the soundtrack. Thereafter, she turned the screen off every day, at first only for an hour, later for longer and longer periods. Once she found herself chatting gaily to her reflection, and hastily fell silent. It wasn't as though she were becoming neurotic, she assured herself. It was just the feeling of roominess that made her like the mirror screen. And she was always careful to have it on when Harry arrived home. It was about six months after the full wall had been installed that Harry emerged one day from the lift, smiling in a way that reminded Flora of that earlier evening. He dropped his briefcase into his floor locker, looked around the apartment, humming to himself. "'What is it, Harry?' Flora asked. Harry glanced at her. "'It's not a log cabin in the woods,' he said. "'But maybe you'll like it anyway. "'What is it, dear?' Don't sound so dubious, he broke into a broad smile. I'm getting you another full wall. Flora looked puzzled. But this one is working perfectly, Harry. Of course it is, he snapped. I mean you're getting another wall. You'll have two. What about that? Two full walls, and nobody else in the cell block has one yet. The only question is, he rubbed his hands together, striding up and down the room, eyeing the walls. Which wall is it to be? You can have it adjacent or opposite. I went over the whole thing with the full wall people today. By God, they're doing a magnificent job of programming. You see, the two walls will be synchronised. You're getting the same show on both. You're seeing it from two angles, just as though you were right there in the middle of it. The whole programme has been built on that principle. Harry, I'm not sure I want another wall. Oh, nonsense! What is this, some kind of self-denial urge? Why not have the best, if you can afford it? And by God, I can afford it. I'm hitting my stride. Harry, could I go with you some day? Tomorrow? I'd like to see where you work, meet your friends. Flora, are you out of your mind? You've seen the commuter car. You know how crowded it is. And what will you do when you got there? Just stand around all day, blocking the aisle? Why don't you appreciate the luxury of having your own place, a little privacy, and now two full walls? Then could I go somewhere else I could take a later car? I want to get out in the open air, Harry. I haven't seen the sky for years, it seems. But, Harry groped for words, staring at Flora, why would you want to go up on the roof? Not the roof! I want to get out of the city, just for a little while. I'll be back home in time to dial your dinner. Do you mean to tell me you want to spend all that money to wedge yourself in a verticar and then transfer to a cross town and travel maybe seventy miles, packed in like a sardine, standing up all the way, just so you can get out and stand in a wasteland and look back at the walls, and then get back in another car, if you're lucky, and come back again? No, I don't know. I just want to get out, Harry. The roof. Could I get to the roof? Harry came over to pat Flora awkwardly on the arm. Now, take it easy, Flora. You're a little tired and stale. I know. I get the same way sometimes. But don't get the idea that you're missing anything by not having to get into that rat race. Heaven knows I wish I could stay home. And this new wall is going to make things different. You'll see. The new full wall was installed adjacent to the first, with a joint so beautifully fitted that only the finest line marked the junction. As soon as she was alone with it, Flora switched it off. Now two reflections stared back at her from behind what appeared to be two intersecting planes of clear glass. She waved an arm. The two slave figures aped her. She walked toward the mirrored corner. They advanced. She stepped back. They retreated. She went to the far corner of the room and studied the effect. It wasn't as nice as before. Instead of a simple room, neatly bounded on all four sides by solid walls, she seemed now to occupy a stage set off by windows through which other similar stages were visible. Endlessly repeated. 
the old feeling of intimate companionship with her reflected self was gone. The two mirror women were strangers, silently watching her. Defiantly, she stuck out her tongue. The two reflections grimaced menacingly. With a small cry, Flora ran to the switch, turned the screens on. They were seldom off after that. Sometimes, when the hammering of hooves became too wearying, or the shouting of comics too strident, she would blank them out and sit, back to the mirror walls, sipping a cup of hot cofflet and waiting. But they were always on when Harry arrived, sometimes glum, sometimes brisk and satisfied. He would settle himself in his chair, waiting patiently enough for dinner, watching the screens. "'They're all right,' he would declare, nodding. "'Look at that, Flora. Look at the way that fellow whipped right across there. By golly, you've got to hand it to the full wall people.' "'Harry, where do they make the shows? The ones that show the beautiful scenery, the trees and rolling hills and mountains?' Harry was chewing. "'Don't know,' he said. "'On location, I suppose.' "'Then there really are places like that. I mean, they aren't just making it up?' Harry stared at her, mouth full and half open. He grunted and resumed chewing. He swallowed. "'I suppose that's another of your cracks.' "'I don't understand, Harry,' Flora said. He took another bite glanced sideways at her puzzled expression. "'Of course they aren't making it up. How the devil could they make up a mountain? I'd like to see those places.' "'Here we go again,' Harry said. "'I was hoping I could enjoy a nice meal and then view a while, but I guess you're not going to allow that. O of course, Harry, I just said—' "'I know what you said. Well, look at them, then,' he waved his hand at the screen. "'There it is.' the whole world. You can sit right here and view it all. But I want to do more than just view it. I want to live it. I want to be in those places, and feel leaves under my feet, and have rain fall on my face. Harry frowned incredulously. You mean you want to be an actress? No, of course not. I don't know what you want. You have a home, two full walls, and this isn't all. I'm working towards something, Flora. Flora sighed. "'Yes, Harry, I'm very lucky.' "'Darn right!' Harry nodded emphatically, eyes on the screens. "'Dial me another cofflet, will you?' The third full wall came as a surprise. Flora had taken the 1100 car to the robo-clinic on the 478th level for her annual check-up. When she returned home, there it was. She hardly noticed the chorus of gasps cut off abruptly as the door shut and the faces of the other wives in the car. Flora stood, impressed in spite of herself by the fantastic panorama filling her apartment. Directly before her, the studio audience gaped up from the massed seats. A fat man in the front row reached inside a red plaid shirt to scratch. Flora could see the perspiration on his forehead. Farther back, a couple nuzzled, eyes on the stage. Who were they? Flora wondered. How did they manage to get out of their apartments and offices and sit in a real theatre? To the left, an owlish youth blinked from a brightly lit cage, and on the right, the MC caressed the mic, chattering. Flora deployed her chair, sank down, looking first this way, then that. There was so much going on and she was in the middle of it. She watched for half an hour, then retracted the chair, deployed the bed. She was tired from the trip. A little nap. She stopped with her first zipper. The MC was staring directly at her, leering. The owlish youth blinked at her. The fat man scratched himself, staring up at her from the front row. She couldn't undress in front of all of them. She glanced around, located the switch near the door. With a click, the scene died around her. The glowing walls seemed to press close, fading slowly. Flora turned to the one remaining opaque wall, undressed slowly, her eyes on the familiar pictures. 
the children. She hadn't seen them since the last semi-annual vacation week. The cost of travel was so high, and the crowding. She turned to the bed, and the three mirror-bright walls confronted her. She stared at the pale figure before her, stark against the wall patched with its faded mementos. She took a step. On either side, an endless rank of gaunt, nude figures stepped in unison. She whirled, fixed her eyes gratefully on the familiar wall, the thin crevice outlining the door, the picture of the sea. She closed her eyes, groped her way to the bed. Once covered by the sheet, she opened her eyes. The beds stood in a row, all identical, each with its huddled figure like an infinite charity ward, she thought, or like a morgue where all the world lay dead. Harry munched his yeast chop, his head moving from side to side as he followed the action across the three walls. "'It's marvellous, Flora, marvellous! But it can be better yet,' he added mysteriously. "'Harry, couldn't we move to a bigger place, and maybe do away with two other walls? I—' "'Flora, you know better than that. I am lucky to have gotten this apartment when I did. There's nothing, absolutely nothing, available.' He chuckled. In a way, the situation is good job insurance. You know, I couldn't be fired, even if the company wanted to. They couldn't get a replacement. A man can't very well take a job if he hasn't a place to live in the city. And I can sit on this place as long as I like. We might get tired of issue rations, but by God we could hold on. So not that anybody's in danger of getting fired. We could move out of the city, Harry. When I was a girl— "'Oh, not again!' Harry groaned. "'I thought that was all threshed out long ago.' He fixed a pained look on Flora. "'Try to understand, Flora. The population of the world has doubled since you were a girl. Do you realise what that means? There are more people alive now than had been born in all previous human history up to fifty years ago. That farm you remember visiting as a kid. It's all paved now. There are tall buildings there. The highways you remember.' full of private autos, all driving across open country, they're all gone. There aren't any highways or any open country except the TV settings and a few estates like the President's Acre and a half. Not that any sun hits it, with all those buildings around it, and maybe some essential dry land farms for stuff they can't synthesise or get from the sea. There has to be some place we can go. It wasn't meant that people should spend their lives like this, away from the sun— the sea. A shadow crossed Harry's face. I can remember things too, Flora, he said softly. We spent a week at the beach once, when I was a small boy. I remember getting up at dawn with the sky all pink and purple, and going down to the water's edge. There were little creatures in the sand, little wild things. I could see tiny fish darting along in a wave crest, just before it broke. I could feel the sand with my toes. The gulls sailed around overhead, and there was even a tree. But it's gone now. There isn't any beach anywhere. That's all over. He broke off. Never mind. That was then. This is now. They've paved the beach, and built processing plants on it, and they've paved the farms and the parks and the gardens. But they've given us full wall to make up for it, and— there was a buzz from the door. Harry got to his feet. They're here, Flora. Wait till you see. Something seemed to tighten around Flora's throat as the men emerged from the lift, gingerly handling the great roll of wall screen. Harry? Four walls, Harry said triumphantly. I told you I was working towards something, remember? Well, this is it. By God, the Harry Trimbles have shown them. Harry, I can't. "'Not four walls. I know you're a little overwhelmed, but you deserve it, Flora. "'Harry, I don't want four walls. I can't stand it. It will be all around me.' "'Harry stepped to her side, gripped her wrist fiercely. "'Shut up!' he hissed. "'Do you want the workmen to think her out of your mind?' "'He grinned at the men. "'How about a cofflet, boys?' "'You kidding?' one inquired. "'The other went silently about the work of rolling out the panel, "'attaching contact strips.' Another reached for the sea scene. No! Flora threw herself against the wall. 
as though to cover the pictures with her body. "'You can't take my pictures! Harry, don't let them!' "'Look, sister, I don't like the crummy pictures. "'Flora, get hold of yourself. "'Here, I'll help you put the pictures in your floor locker.' "'Bunch of nuts,' one of the men muttered. "'Here, keep a civil tongue in your head,' Harry started. "'The man who had spoken stepped up to him. "'He was taller than Harry and solidly built. "'Any more crap out of you, and I'll break you in off. "'You and the old bag, shut up and keep out of my way. "'I've got a job to do.' Harry sat beside Flora, his face white with fury. "'You and your vaporings," he hissed. "'So I have to endure this. I have a good mind to—' He trailed off. The men finished, and left with all four walls blaring. "'Harry,' Flora's voice shook, "'how will you get out? They've put it right across the door. They've sealed us in.' "'Don't be a bigger idiot than you have to.' Harry's voice was ugly over the thunder from the screens. He went to the newly covered wall, groped, found the tiny pin switch. At a touch, it slid aside as always, revealing the blank face of the lift shaft safety door. A moment later, it too slid aside, and Harry forced his way into the car. Flora caught a glimpse of his flushed, angry face as the door closed. Around her, the walls roared. A saloon fight was in full swing. She ducked as a chair sailed toward her, whirled to see it smash down a man behind her. Shots rang out. Men ran this way and that. The noise were deafening. That man, Flora thought, the vicious one. He had set it too loud purposely. The scene shifted. Horses galloped across the room. Dust clouds rose, nearly choking her in the verisimilitude of the illusion. It was as though she crouched under a small square canopy of ceiling in the middle of the immense plain. Now there were cattle, wild-eyed, with tossing horns, bellowing, thundering in an unbroken sea across the screens, charging at Flora out of the wall, pouring past her on left and right. She screamed, shut her eyes, and ran blindly to the wall, groping for the switch. The uproar subsided. Flora gasped in relief, her head humming. She felt faint, dizzy. She had to lie down. Everything was going black around her. The glowing walls swirled, fading. Flora sank to the floor. Later, perhaps a few minutes, maybe hours, she had no way of knowing. Flora sat up. She looked out across an infinite vista of tile floor which swept away to the distant horizon in all directions as far as the eye could see, and over all that vast plain hollow-eyed women crouched at intervals of fifteen feet in endless numbers, waiting. Flora stared into the eyes of the nearest reflection. It stared back, a stranger. She moved her head quickly to try and catch a glimpse of the next woman, but no matter how fast she moved, the nearer woman anticipated her, interposing her face between Flora and all the others. Flora turned. A cold-eyed woman guarded this rank, too. "'Please!' Flora heard herself pleading. "'Please! Please!' She bit her lip, eyes shut. She had to get hold of herself. These were only mirrors. She knew that. Only mirrors. The other women, they were mere reflections. Even the hostile ones who hid the others— they were herself, mirrored in the walls. She opened her eyes. She knew there were joints in the glassy wall. All she had to do was find them, and the illusion of the endless plain would collapse. There, that thin black line, like a wire stretched from floor to ceiling, that was a corner of the room. She was not lost in an infinitude of weeping women on a vast plain. She was right there, in her own apartment alone. She turned, finding the other corners. They were all there, all visible. She knew what they were. But why did they continue to look like wires, setting apart the squares of floor, each with its silent, grieving occupant? She closed her eyes again, fighting down the panic. She would tell Harry. As soon as he came home, it was only a few hours, she would explain it to him. 
I am sick, Harry. You have to send me away to some place where I'll lie in a real bed, with sheets and blankets, beside an open window, looking out across fields and forests. Someone, someone kind, will bring me a tray with a bowl of soup, real soup, made from real chickens and with real bread and even a glass of milk, and a napkin made of real cloth. She should find her bed and deploy it, and rest there until Harry came, but she was so tired. It was better to wait here, just relaxing, not thinking about the immense floor and the other women who waited with her. She slept. When she awoke, she sat up, confused. There had been a dream. But how strange! The walls of the cell block were transparent now. She could see all the other apartments stretching away to every side. She nodded. It was as she thought. They were all as barren and featureless as her own. And Harry was wrong. They all had four full walls. And the other women, the other wives, shut up like her in these small mean cells. They were all ageing and sick and faded, starved for fresh air and sunshine. She nodded again and the woman in the next apartment nodded in sympathy. All the women were nodding. They all agreed. Poor things! When Harry came, she would show him how it was. He would see that the full walls weren't enough. They all had them, and they were all unhappy. When Harry came... It was time now. She knew it. After so many years, you didn't need a watch to tell when Harry was due. She had better get up, make herself presentable. She rose unsteadily to her feet. The other husbands were coming too, Flora noted. All the wives were getting ready. They moved about, opening their floor lockers, patting at their hair, slipping into another dress. Flora went to the Diana Ration, and all around, in all the apartments, the wives deployed the tables and dialed the dinners. She tried to see what the woman next door was dialing, but it was too far. She laughed at the way her neighbour craned to see what she was preparing. The other woman laughed too. She was a good sport. Kelpies, Flora called cheerily, and Moxbam and Cofflet. Dinner was ready now. Flora turned to the door wall and waited. Harry would be so pleased at not having to wait. Then, after dinner, she'd explain about her illness. Was it the right wall she was waiting before? The line around the door was so fine you couldn't really see it. She laughed at how funny it would be if Harry came in and found her standing, staring at the wrong wall. She turned and saw a movement on her left, in the next apartment. Flora watched as the door opened. A man stepped in. The next-door woman went forward to meet him. To meet Harry. It was Harry! Flora whirled. Her four walls stood blank and glassy while all around her the other wives greeted Harry, seated him at their tables, and offered him cofflet. Harry! she screamed, throwing herself at the wall. It threw her back. She ran to the next wall, hammering, screaming, Harry! Harry! In all the other apartments, Harry chewed, nodded, smiled. The other wives poured, fussed over Harry, nibbled daintily, and none of them, not one of them, paid the slightest attention to her. She stood in the centre of the room, not screaming now, only sobbing silently. In the four glass walls that enclosed her, she stood alone. There was no point in calling any longer. No matter how she screamed, how she beat against the walls, or how she called for Harry, she knew that no one would ever hear. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past every single day.